Ladies and gentlemen, good morning or afternoon, depending on where you're located. We're going to get started. Thank you for attending the second session of our Summit on Options and ETFs presented by the Options Industry Council. My name is Nick Ziegler, and I'm a staff member here at the OIC. I'll be guiding you through today's session. We're glad you could join. Join us. In the second of today's four sessions, we'll be building on our previous discussion about exchange traded funds or ETFs. You'll learn how to apply options to ETFs as well as how those option strategies can protect gains and limit losses. We'll be covering the material as well as your questions in a quick 60-minute session. Our instructor today is the OIC's Director of Retail Education, Mr. Joe Burgoyne. Joe has spent more than three decades in the financial industry and brings a special understanding of options and investments to our discussion. Please note that the windows on your desktop are resizable, so feel free to move the slides around for ease of viewing. At the top right of each box, you'll see buttons to maximize and minimize each window, so please use those, especially on the slides, so you have the best viewing experience. You'll also note that there's a box on the right side of your screen where you're able to submit questions at any point during the presentation. Joe will be responding to those questions during the end of today's session, so make sure to stick around for our entire webinar. Please note that this box is for content-related questions only. If you're having technical issues, the leftmost icon at the bottom, the question mark, is a link to our webcast provider's support page. Just under the questions box, you'll see a survey. Please fill it out at any point during the session so we can better serve you and investors like you with our future webinars. These survey responses are extremely important to us and will help guide our future programming. As I mentioned, there is a row of icons along the bottom of your screen. Each icon corresponds to one of the windows in the webcast, so if you rearrange your workspace and are looking for a specific part of the webcast, you can return to that part by clicking those icons. For your convenience, you can access a PDF version of today's content via a download link that's just below your slide window. And if you'd like to review the entire webinar, an on-demand version will be available a few hours from now via the same link you used to join us today. Additionally, our previous webinars can be viewed on the OIC YouTube channel. And if you're not yet signed up for the remaining two webinars we're holding today, please visit optionseducation.org for those registration links. And now, ladies and gentlemen, Joe Burgoyne will bring you our topic today, Enhance ETFs with Option Strategies. Joe? Nick, thanks so much, and uh, thanks to everybody for joining us uh, with this big day of education on uh, ETFs and option strategies. Uh, really appreciate you joining us. Um, and at first, I'd like to just give a shout out to uh, you know iShares Craig Danner for just laying a great foundation for uh, you know really what the ETF space is and how it's grown over recent years. So thank you, Craig. Uh, we'll get started just by mentioning that uh, for those of you who currently use options, and I'm guessing that's most of you, uh, the industry does provide a document called Characteristics and Risks of Standardized Options. If uh, you don't have a copy, you should reach out to your broker or the OCC to make sure you have that. Um, before we get started, I'm guessing uh, typically about half of attendees have never attended an OIC event, so you know who we are, both the OIC and OCC. OIC is the industry uh, cooperative funded by the OCC and the exchanges. We've existed since 1992 with a sole mission of educating investors on the benefits and risks of the listed options product. Uh, the OCC, you may not be as familiar with, uh, the OCC is the world's largest equity derivatives clearing organization and indeed the foundation for secure markets. Uh, OCC is now uh, providing central counterparty clearing and settlement services to 16 exchanges and trading platforms for options, financial futures, security futures, and security lending transactions. So uh, that's the OIC and OCC. Uh, the exchanges that help provide funding are the seven parent companies listed, the BATS Exchange, the BOX Exchange, Chicago Board Options Exchange, ISE, MIAX Exchange, the NASDAQ, and also the New York Stock Exchange. They're the seven parent companies. For those of you who have heard me in the past, you know that this is one of my very favorite slides. It shows growth in the options industry from inception. Inception was back in 1973 at the Chicago Board Options Exchange. 
That day we started with 16 underlying companies. I think that first day we traded 928 contracts. I wasn't there personally, but uh, you know I'm a student of history. Um, so over time, and as you'll see, the numbers on the left-hand side of the chart correspond to billions of contracts uh, from 73 up until uh, the late 90s. You know, the industry grew to somewhere in the neighborhood of 500 million contracts. And then a few things happened uh, in the late 90s and 2000 when the first electronic exchange uh, that I mentioned before, the ISE, was founded. So that gave investors electronic access to the market, which uh, certainly helped with option volume coupled with a dual listing of the various listings on the exchanges rather than just going to one exchange. Uh, in 99, you could start to go to uh, the five different exchanges to buy and sell options. So uh, those two events coupled with increased technology on the part of the brokers um, helped option volume to grow. And as you can see, uh, between 99, 2000 and current uh, option volume has really exploded to the point where uh, over the last four years, we've done in, in excess of over 4 billion contracts. Last year, uh, just over 4.3 billion. That breaks down to just under 17 million contracts a day. So there are a lot of folks using listed options. And this, of course, is a presentation on ETFs and options. And that ETF option growth has been incredibly significant. If we go back uh, the last eight to nine years, I think listed option volume has uh, more than doubled, but option volume on ETFs has more than quadrupled. So um, that's part of the reason why we chose today to focus on uh, the whole idea of ETF and options in uh, today's summit. Our next slide will um, take us to uh, the presentation and um, back up, uh, I think that, there we go. Um, we're gonna cover know exactly what options are on ETFs. We'll talk about uh, five you know, approaches, some may call them strategies, buying an ETF call, buying an ETF put, uh, buying an ETF protective put, doing a covered call for an ETF, and then rolling that into a collar. So that's what we're going to cover over the next 50 minutes or so. Um, just let's, I think, uh, back it down in terms of talking about the foundation of what options on ETFs are. Uh, just like standard options, option contracts on ETFs give the holder uh, or the buyer the right uh, and the seller takes on an obligation or the writer uh, to buy or sell 100 shares of that ETF at the all-important strike or exercise price at any time before expiration. Um, ETF options are considered equity options, and they're available on a variety of ETFs. Somewhere in the neighborhood of about 550 ETFs do have options on them. And then for those of you who are in, uh, interested in LEAPs, which are longer dated options, I think about a third of those 500 or so ETF listings uh, do have LEAP options on them. So ETF versus equity options, you know, what are the differences? Uh, the underlying with the ETF option, you have the ETF underlying. Uh, with an equity option, it's stock. You do get physical settlement of that underlying. Uh, it's important to realize that each option corresponds to 100 shares. Expiration is the same, third Friday of the month. That's for the standard options, of course, not the weeklies. Last trading day would be uh, expiration Friday, unless it's a holiday, and it'll be Thursday. The exercise style, for those of you new to options, you know, you have American style and European style. ETF options are American style, which means they can be exercised or assigned at any time uh, up to expiration. Uh, trading hours, you know, may vary a little bit on the ETF option, so you got to be very careful to uh, be clear on what the trading hours are. Uh, equity options, from a central time standpoint, trade from 8.30 to 3 p.m. Central. And then, uh, as I said, each uh, option corresponds to 100 shares of the underlying, so the multiplier is 100. And uh, option premiums, you have to take that price and multiply that by 100 as well. In terms of pricing factors, just like regular listed options, um, we've got the underlying ETF price, again, that all-important strike price. And 
for those, again, for those of you new to options, the difference between the underlying price and the strike price is very important, um, and we'll go through that uh, with some examples as we move through the presentation. Uh, volatility on the ETF shares is one of those pricing factors, time to expiration, of course, the cost of money or interest rates and dividends if there are any. Additionally, um, I mentioned volatility on the ETF shares, that, that implied volatility, which is the pricing factor that can be most important when it comes to uh, how high or low the premium, the time premium is in that option. Uh, basically is an important factor as well, and um, finding that implied volatility uh, versus the historic volatility can be done at uh, our website, which is optionseducation.org. Under the drop-down tools and resources, you look for historic and implied vols. Um, another point just uh, to mention is that volatility and time decay uh, do affect just the time value portion of the option premium. Uh, another important tool that you can find on the website at optionseducation.org is the pricing calculator. I mean, really, spending 10, 15, 30 minutes, plug in your favorite ETF, plug in the strike price, days to expiration, change the volatility, and you know, you'll see the different prices come up. You can put in, you know, the current price, and then you can put in a price based on your forecast, see how those uh, put-and-call prices change. So that's the pricing calculator at optionseducation.org. There are some important differences between ETF options and index options. Uh, the ETF options have the, uh, the physical settlement where the index options settle in cash. ETF options, as I mentioned, have American-style exercise. Um, most index options are European style. European style means you can only exercise the day of expiration. Okay, um, the underlying in an ETF may be bought and sold. That's not the case for the index options. And then generally the ETF options have uh, smaller strike increments versus the index options, which oftentimes have larger strike increments. Ways to use ETF options really very similar to our standard options. You know, you can capitalize uh, long options with, uh, you know, different movements on the underlying potential for leverage profits. Importantly, uh, again, depending on the strategy, predefined uh, potential profits and losses, but that gets into what strategies you employ. Um, with different ETF choices, you can adjust, uh, you know, one trade versus another for different hedging purposes. So uh, just really similar to your standard listed options, lots of different useful purposes for these ETF options. And um, the ETF products that listed our options on include stocks, bonds, commodities, which I'll speak about a little bit more, uh, volatility, international stocks, currencies, fixed income. Um, and with regards to the commodity ETFs, um, options on these can be used in lots of different commodity markets. And one of the benefits there is that the ETFs have an advantage over the CFTC-regulated commodity options because the risk offset that you can keep them in a securities account rather than a full futures account is, uh, is pretty significant. Um, also, the sector ETFs can be used to diversify a portfolio, and um, you know that uh, that can be a good approach as well. So, that's uh, a little bit of an overview on ETF options versus uh, standard equity options. We're going to roll into uh, the whole idea of the five different approaches or, or strategies that we talked about, and. Again, this happens to be one of my favorite slides. I mean, it looks like uh, some kind of crazy puzzle, I think, but why ETF options and why bother? I mean, why bother is because, as I mentioned, all kinds of different diversification possibilities, uh, limiting risk, uh, limiting reward based on your risk tolerance. But what this slide represents, and um, I would urge those of you who are new to options not to be concerned about understanding the 18 different strategies uh, that are mentioned here. I mean, I'm a big believer, you know, use a handful of ETFs that you're comfortable, uh, a handful of, of, of stocks possibly as well. And then, you know, for each 
different type of movement in the underlying, bullish, bearish, or neutral, find one, two, or three option strategies that suit you. As I said, we've got 18 here. What the blue lines represent, and you know, this is something that I would ask you to work towards in your knowledge of options. When you put on a strategy, try to understand in your mind you know, that blue line. And just go top right in this slide. You can see the short straddle example. Um, a short straddle is when you're short a call, short a put. You can see that if, if the stock uh, doesn't go anywhere, and that's what that vertical line represents, uh, the stock price, if the stock doesn't go anywhere, you're going to collect the decay of the short call and the short put. But, and most importantly in my mind, the risk associated with something like that, you can see that the lines just go straight down, and that represents you know, significant and sometimes to the upside, unlimited risk, uh, very significant risk to the downside. Um, most investors don't want to be in that type of situation. So these different lines represent potential profit and loss. If you go just below the short straddle to uh, you know that other blue line, you can see that you know, the risk to the downside levels off. That blue line goes horizontal. And oftentimes that's what uh, many investors want. They want manageable risk. So buying an ETF call, let's go through, uh, you know, an example of that. We've got a bullish investor who uh, likes a particular industry sector, um, not sure about which stock to purchase. So uh, he decides he wants to buy an option on an ETF XYZ. And for those of you who've listened to OIC before, you know that XYZ is our favorite underlying, whether it's a stock or an ETF. Our decision here is to buy one XYZ ETF call. Um, of course, the motivations there, obviously, you know, the idea is to make a profit, but uh, we'll go through the example. You can see how, you know, the whole idea of leverage comes into uh, the whole options product. So, Different choices um, when we talk about buying a call, a put, or you know, using any particular option is what strike. And we're going to focus on that here, what strike, but then the other big question is what month. So when we talk about strikes, we talk about potentially in the money, at or out of the money, or even further out of the money. And each of them has different risks associated with them. Um, in our example, uh, let's take XYZ currently priced at $75, and, and we'll walk through uh, the different strikes and whether they're in, at, or out of the money and the different prices associated with them. So XYZ, ETF XYZ is $75. Uh, you can see in the box we've got three different strike prices, the 74 strike, the 75, and the 76 strike. Well, our action, we decide to buy one 74 call, and you can see the price is 290 there. The call is in the money, and for those of you, again, who are somewhat new to the option space, the price of the stock is 75. As I mentioned earlier, it's real important to understand the difference between the strike price, which in this example is 74, versus the stock price, which is 75. And with a 74 strike price, what buying that option gives us the right to is the right to buy 100 shares of ETF XYZ at 74. And for that, we're paying a premium of $2.90. With the underlying at 75, we've got a dollar of built-in value in that call. So in essence, we're paying a dollar ninety of premium on top of the dollar of uh, intrinsic value is the terminology for that in the money price. Um, so we're tying up 290, multiply that by 100, so a total of $290 uh, tied up uh, for the right to buy ETF XYZ at 75. Uh, now, and this is where the whole idea of leverage and uh, effective and efficient use of money comes in. If we compare the purchase of just buying 100 shares of XYZ, you know, we could buy that at 75, but we got to tie up $7,500 versus 290. And oh, by the way, with that, we've got $7,500 of risk versus $290 of risk. So always, always be mindful of the risk associated with any option or any investment for that matter. 
Um, and then just to take a step back, just so we're clear on this whole idea of in the money, now the stock's 75, or the, the ETF is 75. So that 75 call priced at 240 would be considered an at the money call. Makes sense. The index is uh, 75, the ETF is 75. So that 75 call is an at the money. And then the 76 call, the right to buy the ETF at 76 would be a dollar out of the money and therefore cost less than either the at or in the money option. So I hope that makes sense. From a uh, risk reward standpoint, going back to that slide with 18 different strategies, uh, trying to understand what that uh, bl solid blue line, uh, if you can see that in your mind, that's the risk reward of this particular position. So our break even at expiration. And um, it's pretty straightforward. We basically take that strike price, which is 74, plus the premium we paid, the 290, gives us $76.90. That's our break even at expiration. Maximum loss, no matter, you know, our, our maximum loss is the 290, the $290. We can't lose more uh, than what we pay for any option. So uh, we buy an option for 290, our risk is 290, we buy an option for a dollar, it's 100 bucks. Depending on what we pay, our debit paid is the most we can lose for an option. So break even is the strike price plus the premium. So at expiration, that ETF, which is currently 75, has to be above 76.90 in order for us to make a profit. And uh, speaking of 76.90, there we are. If we uh, move, move through that slide, um, we can see that 76.90 is going to be our break even. I like to look at the right hand column. I mean, you know, taking that second and third column gives us obviously uh, the nets on the right side. But at 74, just from a conceptual standpoint, you know, if we bought the call, which the 74 call, giving us the right to buy the stock at 74. If the stock closes at 74 at expiration, you know, we're going to lose that 290 bucks, and any price below 74, we're going to lose that 290 bucks. If the stock at expiration went out at 75, uh, which is where it was when we bought the call originally, the value of that call would be $100, so we'd lose 190 bucks. And then to the upside, you can see, at 78, since our break even is 76.90, at 78 we're going to make 110 bucks because the value of that call is going to be four dollars. And again, we bought the 74 strike. It's the right to buy stock at 74 with the stock at 78. That difference is four, so the value of the call is four bucks. We paid 290, profit a dollar ten, and so on and so forth to the upside at 80. You can see, you know, we make another couple hundred dollars, and um, you know that's how it works. But you know, key here is how much money we've put up versus our possible return. So, uh, and this this actually will show us exactly, uh, you know, how that looks. The uh, long call position versus the long stock position. So you can see from a percentage standpoint, uh, the numbers are very significant. Um, and the actual returns on the money put up is significant as well. And again, don't forget, if you're buying those shares of stock at $7,500, you know, you've got $7,500 of risk versus just the 290 with the call. Uh, at expiration, if we buy, uh, you know, that, that XYZ, we talked about break even being 74 plus the 290 takes us to the 7690 break even. If we exercise, so if we own that call, we can either sell it at any time up until expiration and then be out of the position for either a profit or a loss or choose to exercise because by buying an option, we get the right to buy the underlying if, in fact, that's what we want to do. If we did that, um, you know, we would basically uh, have a break even, as I mentioned, at 76.90 and have a risk after exercise because we'd have to put up that $7,690. We'd have a risk far different from when we owned the option. 
we'd have a $70,690 potential downside risk versus the 290 initially we put up uh, to be long the call. So that's the long call side. The long put side in an ETF, you know, uh, very similar to uh, standard options. Puts, you know, buying puts is associated with down markets, so we got a, an investor's bearish, you know, on the broader market, not sure about a particular stock, so, you know, he decides to go in and buy a put on an ETF XYZ. Um, again, looking to uh, make uh, profits with uh, the leverage associated with the options. We get that same choice in the money, at the money, or even further out of the money. We'll take a little different approach here. Um, again, the opinion is that we're bearish over the next two months. XYZ is still currently at 75. We just have a different opinion here. We decide to buy a 70 feet, a 74 put at two dollars. As you can see, the slide says that's out of the money. I hope that makes sense to you. The 75, you can see we've got the 74, 75, and 76 puts there. Um, the 75 put would be at the money because the price of the underlying is 75. The 76 put, which represents the right to sell stock at 76 with the stock at 75, would be a dollar in the money. Our choice was to buy the 74 put, the least expensive put offered here, uh, but again, that's a dollar out of the money because that strike price is a dollar below the price of the stock. The um, break-even point and, and downside uh, is represented by the solid blue line. So we've got significant downside profit, not unlimited because, uh, you know, the ETF can only go to zero. Uh, and you can see our break-even is 72 now let's let's be clear on why it's 72, and that's because we take that strike price, not the price of the stock. Okay, we take the strike and subtract the premium paid. So it's 74 minus the two dollars. Our break even for the put is going to be 72 bucks. And the maximum loss, like I said earlier, if we're paying two dollars, the most we can possibly lose is the two dollars uh, paid in premium. That downside profit potential, as mentioned, is very significant. So how does it look? At 72, we said that's going to be our break-even point. We know that. Um, and then if our forecast is correct and the stock goes down, let's uh, be sure that we're clear on how we're making money. You know, we've bought the right to sell uh, ETF XYZ at $74. So at $70, we have the right to sell stock at 74 At 70 that option's worth $4.00. Um, and then we paid two, so our profit potential there, our profit would be $200, and as we go down, that, that profit potential would increase point for point with the stock at expiration. Well, our forecast was for the underlying to go down if, in fact, you know, the index, uh, the ETF closed right at 74, then we would lose all of our premium because, you know, the put we purchased was the right to sell the underlying at $74. And, of course, anything above 74, that put is out of the money at expiration, and uh, it would have no value. So we'd lose the 200. So, again, um, pointing out the differences in the risks when between when we are long the option versus when we exercise. If we exercise this option um, to sell 100 shares of XYZ at 74, uh, the net we'd receive would be the 74 minus the 200 premium paid. So in essence, it's really selling the stock at 72 uh, for a total credit of $7,200. Again, the risk before expiration and exercising that put was $200. The risk afterwards is the potential for that stock to go, you know, a heck of a lot higher. Theoretically, uh, there's unlimited upside, you know, loss potential because there's no telling how high a stock can do. So understanding that all-important difference in risk before and after expiration is really, really important. Let's take a look at buying an ETF protective put. Okay, this is a combination strategy. So, you know, we have an investor who's long ETF XYZ, but is concerned about the downside and looking for some protection. So, again, the difference here is that 
he or she is long the underlying ETF, but uh, because they're nervous about the downside, they decide to buy one put for each 100 shares of ETF XYZ. Um, again, each option corresponds to 100 shares of that ETF. Upside profit potential, now unlimited. Now you might say, well, we're buying a put. Why is the pro profit potential unlimited? Well, because we're buying an option. So the most we can lose on the option is the premium we pay for that option. But in terms of the underlying, theoretically, that can go to infinity. So, you know, we can make an unlimited amount of profit to the upside. So it is really the upside profit potential and the underlying less the cost of the put which is going to be how we look at our break even with a, prote a protective put strategy. Uh, we've got down downside uh, loss on the XYZ ETF shares. Uh, that's going to be limited uh, because we get the ability to sell the underlying at the strike we choose. And as always, uh, which strike, which month is really important. So here we're long 100 shares of ETF XYZ at 76. Okay, so we bought it at 76. We're already underwater by 100 bucks because currently it's at 75. Our opinion, you know, had been bullish on XYZ, but, you know, in the short term, and who knows what the motivation, whether it's earnings, whether it's just a, a down market, hard to say, but, you know, we have a really pretty specific forecast that over the next 60 days, we're kind of defensive, you know, on, on the market and this ETF in particular. So we decided to buy a little protection. And again, you can see the ETF is currently priced at 75. We bought it at 76. We've got puts uh, that are out of the money because they are all below the current price of the stock. That's what we're looking to do is buy an out of the money put for some, you know, maybe not so expensive, or some may consider expensive insurance over the next 60 days. We've got the 74 strike, the 73 strike, and the 72 strike. So our action, we've already pulled the trigger and bought 100 shares of the ETF at 76. As I said, we're underwater by 100 bucks. We decided to buy one of that mid out of the money put strikes, the 73. We pay a buck and a half. Okay, so. That corresponds to $150 of protection. So let's take a look at our potential break-even point. You can see that solid blue line. The dotted line just represents the stock, up or down. Uh, obviously, we're losing money uh, if the ETF goes down, making money if it goes up. Our break-even point for the protective put strategy in this example is going to be, as the slide says, 7750 And that's because even though the stock's currently 75 we paid 76 so it's got to be the price we paid for the underlying plus the premium for the put the buck and a half gets us to a break even at 7650 so that's the break even to the upside always you know with any any investment you want to be aware of your maximum loss so let's be clear on what that is with this protective put strategy which is essentially buying insurance to the downside. Like any insurance, you know, there's there's a price to pay. So the maximum loss is going to be we're going to take the price of the ETF that we paid, 76, and take that price uh, minus the difference to the strike price that we have purchased the put at, which is 73. So potentially there's a $3 loss on the ETF underlying there and we paid a dollar fifty in premium so that's another on top of that three dollars we've got another dollar fifty so a total of potentially four hundred and fifty dollars in potential losses for this sixty day insurance policy against our ETF that's the maximum downside uh, upside profit potential again is unlimited because uh, you know that ETF theoretically could go to infinity but uh, usually it doesn't happen when I'm long it. So um, how this breaks down, again, 7650 is going to be our break even. Uh, to the downside, you can see no matter, and, and this is um, the protection we buy when we buy a put. 
uh, for each 100 shares of an ETF or underlying that we own, we get stopped out at our break-even point. So it's going to be, uh, we went through that, you know, in this example, as the stock, no matter how, or the ETF, no matter how far it falls, the maximum loss is 450 bucks. Um, the difference between the price we paid for the underlying, the strike, and any premium we paid for that put on top of it. And then to the upside, um, depending on how high the underlying goes, once we have gone above the break-even point, we are flat out long the ETF. So point for point, um, you know, we're making a profit in that ETF with the protective put. In terms of exercising, uh, if we were to sell the 100 uh, ETF shares of XYZ at 73, we'd receive, you know, it would be the 7,300 minus the 150 premium we paid. So uh, $7,150 total would be uh, the total we'd take in for exercising that put. Um, the risk, as we mentioned before in our previous examples, the risk before exercise is limited. And afterwards, um, you know, it's significantly different. So let's roll into the uh, ETF covered call. Actually, uh, have a fair amount on the covered call. Uh, covered calls basically are, are uh, option strategies where investors are seeking to generate income. Extremely popular, in, especially in this uh, age of low interest rates. Uh, part of the driving force be behind both ETF increased volume as well as the overall volume is the uh, this the use of this income strategy with the covered call. So um, in our example, we decide we're going to buy 100 shares of ETF and write one call for each share. Again, the primary motivation is just to increase returns. Um, the covered call will lower uh, the break-even point by the amount that we take in for the call, and um, below there, there is risk, and that's an important thing that you know we're going to talk about. So, call writers' obligations are basically to sell or deliver that short stock at the strike price, at expiration, or before if the underlying is above the strike. Um, the long shares are offset by that short call, and important to understand, and if you look at both uh, the long ETF or the covered call ETF, as the stock heads south uh, down to that lower left quadrant, you can see there's significant loss uh, potential. So the risk in the covered call ETF are the long ETF shares below the premium that was taken in with the sale of the call. Again, different choices, writing in the money calls at or out of the money calls. That all has to do with your forecast on the overall market, the specific ETF. Um, so there are a lot of different factors, but as always, that is an important factor. Uh, that strike price selection combination of what's your risk tolerance, how high or neutral do you think the underlying is going to be over the period of time that you sell a call for, um, and the whole idea, again, is to generate income and outperform in a market that's either just going sideways or maybe uh, heading a little bit south. If, you've got, if you're extremely bullish you know, on the market or an underlying, covered calls would not be the most appropriate strategy unless you know, you're long the underlying and you sell a call that's way out of the money. So uh, maximum profit potential in the covered calls is limited. And that, you know, going back to that slide with 18 different solid blue lines, when those lines above break even go horizontal, that's because chances are you've sold a call. By selling a call, you've taken in cash, you've taken in the credit, but for taking in that cash, you've taken on the obligation to potentially sell the underlying at that strike. Break-even point, uh, always important to understand, is going to be that share price paid, not the strike price, but the share price paid minus the call premium received. Uh, downside loss potential is because it, it is about um, you know the underlying minus the premium 
takes you down to your break even. Below there, you're flat out long stock. So that's important to understand. Uh, as an example, um, we're at, in this particular example, neutral to moderately bullish on XYZ, which is really the perfect um, forecast for a cover call strategy. XYZ TF currently $75. We expect XYZ trade between 73 and 77 over the next 90 days. That's our forecast. Okay, so the underlying 75, we're looking for a narrow range over the next 90 days. We buy 100 shares of ETF XYZ at 75 and sell the 77 call, the right to sell stock at 77 at $210 or $2.10 plus there's a 50 cent dividend before expiration. So you can see our choices. With the stock 75, we have two options that were in the money, the 73 and the 74. We've got the at the money 75s and then the two out of the monies, the 76 and 77s. You know, we were fairly bullish looking for that stock to potentially go to 77. So, um, you know, that's the strike that we chose over the next uh, period of time. So the break even at expiration is going to be, you know, that um, ETF strike price, uh, our price at 75 minus the 210 in premium taken in. So our break even to the downside is 72.90. Anything below 72.90, we're going to be in a loss uh, situation. Maximum profit, uh, if assigned, meaning uh, the stock at expiration or before would have to be above 77, we would have to deliver on our obligation. So that would be um, basically the call premium received, that uh, difference between the stock at 75 and 77. So we've got the $2 of gain there plus the $2.10 we took in for the sale of the call. So in essence, you know, the sale of that stock would be 7910 um, for a total profit in this example over 90 days of $410, you know, a handsome return. So uh, this, uh, you know, is kind of how it breaks down. Again, we were neutral to uh, slightly bullish on the underlying. You can see bottom right-hand side, if the underlying ETF heads south, potentially, we've got some downside losses and they can be significant because we know below our break even, we're just flat out long the ETF. To the upside, our maximum profit potential as we went through is the dif difference between uh, the price we paid for the underlying and the strike price we're short, coupled with the premium we paid, that $410. So um, that's our covered call ETF. Um, just to just to uh, touch on the whole idea of early assignment for dividends, the uh, early assignment is possible for a dividend on or before the ex-dividend date. You might expect early assignment when expiration is relatively near. Um, the dividend can be greater than the call times value. So as we get close to a dividend, if the premium in the option is lower, than the value of the dividend, we can expect assignment. Otherwise, we shouldn't be assigned. And an example of that, with this XYZ, if we pay a uh, 50 cent dividend, and the X dividend date is four days before expiration, if the X date uh, and the stock is trading at 78.50, and that 77 call is trading for 160, if the time value is only $0.10 cents and the dividend is 50 we know darn well we're going to get assigned. So that's how it works. If the premium is less than the amount of the dividend, you can expect to be assigned before expiration with a short call position. Um, quickly, just to run through how the return calculations work, two different things to consider. We've got a static return worksheet. That's when the stock doesn't move. So in our example, we know we sold the call for $2.10. We had a 50 cent dividend. Total income was $2.60. The dividend, uh, we divide that by the price of the stock and our net income percentage over the 90 days was three 
and a half percent. If we could do that, um, you know, over and over, over the course of a year, it'd be a little over four times. That would come out to uh, about a 14% return. But the important thing here is we take the income taken in divided by the ETF price to give us our um, estimated income return. That uh, That's with the static return, where the stock you know hasn't moved. Uh, the other type is if called. So if called, you know, just um, from a common sense standpoint, means that the stock has gone to the strike. So we're going to have additional income. We've got the 210 we took in. We've got the 50 cent dividend. But this is where the if called return changes substantially. So we've got the stock at 75. In order to get called, the stock has to be above 77 at expiration. So we add an extra $200 of income there, or $4.60. Divide that by the price of the ETF. There's our return. Again, to be able to do that time after time, which is not necessarily the case. Option premiums expand and contract over time. So uh, chances are you're not going to be able to do it for exactly the same rate of return, sometimes higher, sometimes lower. Uh, but in this example, that would uh, you know, turn out to about 25%. So um, that's static and if called returns, again, it's it's you take the income divided by the price of the underlying, and uh, that's how you get your return. So that's the whole idea of the covered call. It's about income generation in a neutral to maybe modestly bullish environment. Now, if you've got you know potentially you got a covered call on, uh, but you might be nervous about the downside. You know, what might you do? Well, you know, you could turn around and sell your cover call, but then there's something else, another strategy out there that uh, I think more and more investors are becoming comfortable with, and especially uh, the market's been choppy now for a period of time. But, uh, you know, for that five, five and a half year period, we had some uh, really significant run-ups in, in underlyings, and uh, investors had a, a lot of profits in, in some of their underlyings with some covered calls. So, one consideration is to roll that covered call um, where maybe you're long 100 of uh, the ETF XYZ at 75, and again, you're short that 77 call for 210 um, in order to potentially lock in a profit or protect the downside, you can roll into something that's called the collar. And what the collar is, is really a combination of two strategies. The collar starts with the covered call, long the underlying, um, and again, each 100 shares corresponds to uh, 100 shares of, uh, each option corresponds to 100 shares of the underlying, one put and one call versus 100 shares, always that one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one ratio. Um, so we've got long stock, short call, and then the long put. Uh, which gives us our downside protection. So it really, as I said, can be considered two strategies in one. You've got the upside covered call where we uh, were long the stock or the index, the ETF, and short that, in our example, the out-of-the-money call. And then for the downside protection, again, we can buy that protective put, which is typically out-of-the-money as well. So we've got... Uh, the reasons for using these collars is really very straightforward, just locking in uh, profits and uh, giving you some downside protection as well. Before we use a collar, uh, you know, the important thing is to consider, okay, we're looking for some downside protection. Are we going to pay for it? Um, are we going to do it uh, for maybe dollar neutral, or are we actually going to do it where we can take in some money? And so what's important here is what strike do we really want to pick and how much protection are we looking for? As always, how much time is really important. So um, it's really the different factors are around how, how you feel about the underlying and what you're looking for in terms of being able to potentially do this uh, collar strategy for a net debit a net credit, or, you know, the terminology when it's done for dollar neutral is a zero-cost collar. So on the one hand, you may, uh, in our 
example on the slide, you know, if you're paying more for the put than you take in for the call, obviously that's going to be a debit. And again, it depends on the strikes you choose uh, that's going to define whether you're able to do these dollars for the debit, credit, or zero cost. And um, that's just something hopefully you get familiar with the various strikes and premiums in those ETFs that you uh, are most familiar with. In the example here, we've got uh, the ETF XYZ. Uh, we own that for $76.50. We've sold the 77 call. That call's just out of the money by 50 cents. We've taken in $2.10 for that uh, 77 call. And then in order to convert that covered call into the collar, we turn around and buy a put. And in our example, we choose to buy the 75 put. So that 75 put is a dollar and a half below the price of ETF XYZ. So it's a dollar and a half out of the money. Because the call's so close to the money and the put is you know, considerably more out of the money, we're able to do this trade uh, for a credit. And in the example, it would be a 45 cent credit. So that's how the collar works. Um, it, it can be an awful good strategy if you've got uh, a covered call position on, you've got a, um, you know, some nervousness about the downside, you want to lock in some profits. Also, you don't even have to have the covered call position. You can just have a good run-up in your underlying. And at that point, you can decide, okay, I've got a good run-up. I'm going to pick a call strike where I'm happy to sell the underlying. And then I'm going to buy that downside protection and, uh, you know, lock in my profit. And then, again, depending on your forecast, that will allow you to pick the strikes where the collar will come out to be either zero cost, net debit, or a credit. So I hope that makes sense. Uh, as we wrap up, I guess before we go to a few questions from Nick, um, benefits of ETF uh, shares. Obviously, this whole idea of diversification and uh, really the allocation of uh, a diversified uh, underlying in a single transaction. Um, as you know, the ETFs uh, trade like stock on an exchange, oftentimes lower management costs and potentially certain tax advantages versus mutual funds. Uh, ETF benefits available to option investors. As I mentioned, um, there are a little over 500 ETFs that uh, currently list options on them. And uh, as we mentioned early on, same pricing factors, similar contract terms, American-style uh, exercise, which means they can be exercised or assigned at any time, and there is uh, physical delivery of that ETF. A lot of flexibility, um, wide range of option strategies. I would urge you, don't worry about knowing even uh, a fraction of all the option strategies that are out there. But again, there, there are three ways an underlying ETF can go, up, down, or sideways. Try to get comfortable with a one, two, or at most three option positions for those various types of moves. And then use things like the position simulator uh, to get very, very good at those particular option strategies. Um, of course, you know, whether you're bullish, bearish, or neutral is a big part of it. Uh, the whole idea of income generation and risk management is also, uh, you know, critically important as to how and why you want to use options in, in your overlay. So, Nick, uh, I guess before we go to questions, just one last thing. I mentioned uh, that first bullet there. My path is uh, at optionseducation.org. Uh, whether you're new to options or you know, have been around the block quite a bit, my path is an assessment test. We'll ask you to fill out 20 questions. With that, uh, depending on how you do, we will download lessons at either a beginner, intermediate, or advanced level for you. So uh, I would urge you, if you haven't tried my path before, the great thing, you know, like everything we do here at OIC, it's paid for by the OCC and the exchanges, so there's no charge. Um, you can do it 24-7. If you're a night owl, you know, you can, um, you know, do it at night, do it in the morning, anytime that suits you. Of course, we've got lots of podcasts and videos, webinars and seminars, so uh, do try to take advantage of the various offerings of uh, the Options Industry Council. Nick, uh, 
happy to take on some questions if, uh, if we've got a few. Absolutely, do. Joe. We do have a few questions today, but uh, before we do that, I want to remind our listeners that if we're not able to get to the question that you submitted, or if you have tools about uh, questions about the tools on the OIC website, please contact our investor services team at options at the OCC.com. They're ready to help answer questions about strategies or positions during normal business hours. And please do remember to take that survey. Those responses are extremely valuable to us as we plan our future webinar sessions. As I mentioned, today's session will be archived and accessible in a few hours using that same link you used to join us today. And previous webinars are also available on the OIC YouTube channel, so you can review a number of options, strategies, and concepts at your own pace. And with that, Joe, let's get to some questions. We've got a few minutes left, and uh, we got a lot of people asking about liquidity uh, as it pertains to ETFs on options. Do, do ETFs that have options listed on them have lots of options liquidity? Ah, uh, Thanks, Nick. Good question. Um, you know, it really, uh, some do, others not so much, all right? And that is really just very typical of, of you know, underlyings in general. Uh, there's some stocks and indexes that have lots of liquidity and others uh, that really don't. So I would just urge our attendees to uh, be mindful if, if you're getting into an ETF that is not very liquid in terms of the options. Uh, it's going to cost you more to get in and more to get out uh, because the spreads are going to be wider. So, you know, look at things like uh, the volume, you know, go down your options chain on your platform, or uh, you can find that also at uh, our website, optionseducation.org. Just plug in your favorite ETF. Look at the open interest, you know, uh, all the way down. Take a look at um, the average daily volume or how much, how many options are trading just to get a sense in, and do that for a couple days just so uh, you have an idea whether you're getting into an actively traded ETF or not. Joe, you just mentioned spreads, and that's great because we did have a number of questions specifically about different spread strategies or different collar strategies. Are those strategies applicable when you're looking at options on ETFs? Absolutely, Nick. And, um, you know, as I mentioned a few times, it's not important that um, – you know, investors know all the various option strategies, but um, first, to answer your question, absolutely, you know, st spread strategies are totally applicable to ETFs. So if you like spreads, and, and spreads are a great way to uh, mitigate risk and oftentimes give you a far better risk reward than just the straight out purchase of a call or a put. So, um, you know, just kind of getting back to that liquidity issue. Um, be, be careful that the ETF you're getting into has decent liquidity, and if it does and you like spreads, uh, you should be able to do better than the bid offer, um, you know, bid offer widths on the various uh, options by using spread strategies. Joe, uh, one of our listeners today, I think, has listened to one of your sessions before because I think this person knows about one of your favorite topics, which is uh, IV, implied volatility. Is there a good way to track implied volatility on an ETF? Well, indeed there is, Nick. And, uh, yeah, hopefully that's a regular listener to our programs. Uh, at optionseducation.org, you know, we've got uh, so many tools. It's frankly uh, easy to get a little bit lost and overwhelmed, but looking for implied and historic volatility charts. Uh, I think it's the sixth drop down under tools and resources. I think there's 17 different tools and resources in that drop down. About four or five down on the left hand side, you'll see HV, IV charts, and that's uh, one year charts of historic volatility, which is the amount of movement in the underlying over the last year, so you'll get a, a sense for the HV, and the overlay on that chart will be the IV, the premiums, the implied volatility, the market's expected amount of movement for that underlying going forward. You get a snapshot over the last year, so you can see the range of premiums. Are they flatline? Do they you know, go up a lot before earnings and then contract? So... Um, do go to optionseducation.org, uh, tools and resources, the HV IV charts. Joe, we're just about out of time, but we have time for one quick last question. And I think uh, some of our listeners would be curious, given all your years of experience in the industry, 
do you have a favorite strategy when it pertains to ETF options? Uh, Nick, a favorite strategy? Well, I got to go to, it depends, Nick. Um, it, it really, I don't because uh, to me, each time I'm doing an option trade, I mean, not every trade, but uh, they, they almost are, every situation is different. I, I start with the underlying chart and an opinion of that chart and then go to the implied volatility chart and have an opinion of that. And those two uh, decisions, if you will, my decision on the underlying as well as the implied volatility will then take me to, you know, hopefully one, two, three, or four different option strategy choices. So the answer is no, and that's because, you know, the, the great thing about the markets, they're living and breathing, as are, you know, the price of options and implied volatility. So uh, it just, it depends on how that how I view that ETF and its implied volatility at a particular point in time. Joe, thanks again for your expertise. Do you have any closing comments for our listeners today? Uh, I don't, Nick. Just Well, I guess one, um, do, uh, if you would, um, help us with those surveys. As you know, it's the first time we've done a, an all-day summit. So uh, the surveys, which are always important, maybe even more important today. So if you could take 30 seconds, we'd greatly appreciate it and uh, just hope that uh, our listeners will join us for the next two presentations, Nick. Joe, thanks again. Ladies and gentlemen, also thanks to you for your time today. I know we weren't able to get to all of your questions, but as I mentioned, the Investor Services Desk is ready to help, and you can reach them at options at theocc.com. Again, today's session will be archived and accessible in a few hours from now using the same link you used to join us today. And our webinars are available on the OIC YouTube channel, so review those strategies at your own pace. As Joe just mentioned, if you're not yet signed up for those remaining two webinars that we're holding today, visit optionseducation.org for those registration links. If we have any financial advisors on our webinar today, the MCA program ID for continuing education credit is 15BOE002. That's 15 Bravo Oscar Echo 002. And the FPA program ID is 221307. That's 221307. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for attending, and we hope to see you again next time.